Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to cover chapter 12, which is titled Governments, Systems, and Regimes. Now, in this chapter, we're going to learn the importance of classification. So why classify? In political science, we've seen some similarities and differences between otherwise shapeless collections of facts. I mean, you can think of the many political ideologies, the many types of state apparatus, the types of interest groups. They all share some type of classification. Uh, and when we try to share their similarities and work them together, this can lead us to point number two, which it helps us evaluate the effectiveness of different political systems. If we can create categories, classifications for our governmental systems, uh, the various types of systems, uh, we're going to be able to assess and evaluate just what is happening within each specific political sphere. So there's been many ways to uh, codify or classify these types of things. Classically, uh, we can look back to the writings of uh, Aristotle. Aristotle was concerned with constitutional arrangements, institutional stru uh, structures. Uh, what I mean by this is he was trying to boil things down to their most essential forms. So here's a picture of Aristotle. And some of his questions in his writings would include, who rules? Who is the ruling class? Who is the ruling leadership that will make decisions for a society? And then the second uh, argument that he's going to make, he can classify societies and answer this question, who benefits from rule? Is it the rich? Is it the poor? Is it the elites? Is it everyone? That is something Aristotle is concerned with. And to help us, there is a video on Aristotle, which I will post in the discussion board below. It's his entire biography. It's the works of an astounding man, uh, uh, all flaws and all. Uh, nonetheless, it is a telling tale of just seeing what advances he made, not only in politics, but in science and the arts as well. So Aristotle is going to be one of the major philosophers that political science, trying to boil things down to see how the world actually is, actually operates. So here is what I meant by Aristotle's belief in classification. He argued that these two questions, who rules, who benefits, that is the key to understanding a governmental system. So you may have heard of this before in other classes, but let's go through it uh, all together. In a system of one person ruling, Aristotle boils down, if one person's ruling, there can be two types of, of government that benefits either the ruling class or everyone. And he would say, uh, if one person is in the ruling class, one person making all the decisions, such as a king, an emperor, a queen, a monarch, uh, he wouldn't call them a monarch, he would call them a tyrant. Uh, tyranny is marked by one person making all the decisions, and typically they benefit themselves over the livelihoods and health of their communities they're trying to rule. This is different from what Aristotle calls a monarchy, in which a benevolent king or queen will make decisions that best help the people of their country. He also says similarly that if the few are in charge, think of a small group of elected officials or a small group of officials who get power and don't relinquish it, he would call these groups oligarchies. And in an oligarchy, a group of leaders uh, will benefit themselves. We can think of uh, very powerful individuals who do not open up the decision-making power to large groups of people. Now, Aristotle says that this is not always a bad thing, that if the few are benefiting everyone, he called it an aristocracy. And the aristocratic uh, ideal is that uh, these are the most educated, the most wise, the most benevolent leaders who will always put the interests of everyone ahead of themselves. For Aristotle, the aristocracy meant the rule by the best of the best. And finally, the many. Aristotle is not a fan of democracy 
when it benefits what he calls the poor class. Now, when we think of democracy, uh, Aristotle has a negative view of it. He's, he's living in the time of Athenian democracy, and he has some critiques of it as well. And so in a democracy, he says that when many people have a say, and when they benefit themselves at the expense of the rich or the elites, that is democracy. That is different from what he calls a polity. A polity for Aristotle is when the many are in charge, they vote, they take care of things together collectively, and it's made in the best interest of everyone. Aristotle is going to say that more often than not, things boil down into their worst form, or where the leaders benefit themselves over everyone else. Nonetheless, he makes these classifications to help give us a guide to what is happening in our government. So think about the United States. Does it meet any of Aristotle's definitions? That is a potential question for your discussion board and something to consider. All right, let's move on. Now, you may have also heard, as far as classification goes, uh, things like first world nations or third world countries. And how this has worked out in the past uh, 80 years or so, it, it was assumed that there was a first world. First world nations are capitalist in nature. And they are typically supportive of liberal democracy. That is a democracy where people get to weigh in on important political decisions. And these decisions cannot impact the human rights of a person, such as the freedom of speech, uh, the freedom of religion, and so forth. Uh, the second world typology, second world nations would be defined by communistic rule, dominated by either one party or a small group of people. Now keep in mind, this was developed in the Cold War era. We recognize that this may be politically laden in nature because for people developing these things, they largely, this typology came from the West, in which they maybe saw themselves as superior to other forms of rule. This is also different from the third world. Now, third world nations uh, are considered economically developing nations. These are nations that have not necessarily either industrialized or developed a working class, a working strong middle class. And in this three worlds typology, uh, political scientists argued that these systems were typically authoritarian by nature. People did not have a lot of human rights people's rights would be infringed upon, and they wouldn't have any say in the matter. Now, we can use this typology to try to see uh, why we can classify some nations as first world nations, second world nations, third world nations. But one thing to consider is that there are some challenges to this typology. Just like Aristotle's uh, classifications, uh, things are a little bit more nuanced. And when we look at how to apply the three worlds typology today, there's some problems. Take, for example, uh, the end of the Soviet Union really marks an end to this idea of a communist country uh, trying to develop things and that can't actually sustain economic growth. When we consider uh, this next bullet point, the economic developments in East Asia and the Middle East, places like China, for example, China is marked by their communist system, dominated by one-party rule, yet they are second in GDP, or gross domestic product. We can think of the Middle East, which uh, has some areas which are dominated either by uh, the people in power from their religious institutions or uh, authoritarian rulers. Nonetheless, they too are developing capitalist practices that are uh, unprecedented at least if you think compare it to 100 years ago. Finally, in the 1990s, there was an expansion of democracy in Africa, South America, and so you may have had some of these features. You may have had democracy with also communists, and you would still be considered economically developing nations. Just how would you classify every nation? This uh, three worlds typology sort of gives way. You can't really narrow it down to just three. Now, let's turn our attention to modern systems of political rule. Now, one thing we should understand is Aristotle was trying to boil things down to their most essential components. But 
we as political scientists, we're going to try to do that, but we recognize it's just a big, complex world out there. So no system of classification relies on just one single factor. There are things to consider, such as who rules, like what Aristotle approached, but also how is order achieved? Through authoritarian measures or through more liberal measures as well? Is government power centralized or fragmented? Think of the United States in this scenario. Power is divvied up between the federal government and state governments. How, would that, how does that differ from other nations? Uh, another question is, how is government power acquired and transferred? Is it through election of candidates, elections of parties? Is it through hereditary transferation, uh, transference? We can think of rulers, rulers being passed down generation to generation. We can also look at the question of what is the balance between the state and the individual? Another question, what is the level of material development? Are these countries industrialized, rich, poor? We should try to understand. And finally, how stable is that regime? Once it's in power, does are there major challenges along the way that rocks its ability to get things done? These are all things to consider. And political scientists have tried to boil down things to uh, a couple, five to six regime types. So let's go over the first. Uh, Western liberal democracies are our jumping off point because if you grew up in the United States, we should understand the United States is considered uh, a model for Western liberal democracies. And it's hallmarked by one or more of the following. Uh, we can look at Western liberal democracies having either a two-party system or a multi-party system. Obviously, in the United States, we have the two-party system, but in places like Great Britain or Japan, uh, these are multi-party systems which allow competition amongst multiple parties, not just two or three, but actually many can achieve power. You can also think of the composition of the assembly or legislature, in which these can be unicameral chambers or bicameral chambers, as what's seen in the United States, in which we have a House and a Senate in our legislative branch. We can look at the electoral system. Do we utilize a single member plurality electoral system or a proportional representation system? So let me break these words down for you. In a single member plurality electoral system, uh, there, are, there is only one person who can do the job. One person who is able to do the job uh, that is tasked out. So think of the President of the United States. The president is elected and only one person can be president at a time or one person can be governor at a time. And how do you become that single member who oversees the entire district or state or nation? Well, you need to simply receive a plurality. Now, plurality is different from a majority. We can think of majority rule as whatever the most people, most number of people want, they get. But in a plurality, it's simply the most people, and it doesn't necessarily have to be greater than 50%. This can mean that if you have a single member district plurality electoral system, uh, the plurality means that imagine there are 10 candidates, one candidate receives the most votes, but it's only 20%. We can see that that's what makes it a plurality. This is different from a proportional representation system in which uh, parties are uh, seen as very competitive. It is actually similar to a multi-party system uh, in the fact that uh, you are trying to elect parties to handle the business for you. And so there, instead of voting for candidates, you vote for the parties. And the parties make promises on what their agenda will be. And if you were to vote for a party that's not very popular, let's say they gain only 1% of the vote, they can then receive a proportional share of the representation in the legislature. If they receive 1% of the vote, that could be equivalent to 1% of the seats in the legislature. We can look at a unitary or federal government. Obviously, in the United States, we have a federal system of government. Uh, you can also analyze a codified or, or, or uncodified or written constitution. Uncodified means unwritten. And so while there may be a collection of rules, there is no singular document which outlines what uh, 
everything will happen. An uncodified constitution is very different from what we have with our written American constitution, where the rules are as plain as everyone, uh, everyone can see. In an uncodified constitutional system, the constitution is developed over time by acts of, le of the legislature. Now let's talk about uh, the second type of regime, illiberal democracies. Illiberal democracies. So what makes them most notable? Well, one thing is for sure. In an illiberal democracy, regular elections are held, but they're held to maintain the appearance of legitimacy. And in a liberal democracies, they are characterized by personalized leadership. The idea that the state needs to be strong, they need to empower the people in charge, that the opposition needs to be either crushed or held down. Uh, and then we can see the, the textbook uses the word emaciated checks and balances. Emaciated, uh, if we use it in a physical sense, is skinny. We can think of in a political sense as reduced powers of checks and balances. In a liberal democracy, we can see that political and civil rights are selectively suppressed, especially in relation to the media. Now, though there are certain rights that are suppressed, there is no attempt to control every aspect of human life. It's only to control those things which threaten the regime in power. And finally, we see that a liberal democracy shares a disposition towards majoritarianism that is reflected in a general intolerance of pluralism. So in a liber illiberal democracy, you might find that a majority of people really dislike people of a certain ethnicity or religious group or economic class. In, in a liberal democracy, the majorities then can theoretically uh, take measures that would harm these groups simply on the basis of their group membership. And so we should understand that a liberal democracies do not meet all the hallmarks of a Western liberal democracy that places an emphasis on capitalism. And we can see, uh, just to reiterate, we see sometimes this is evident in hostility towards ethnic, cultural, or religious minorities. Now there's another video from uh, that's going to go over Europe's liberal democracies, specifically take note of the countries mentioned. So take a look at the discussion board to take, uh, find out uh, more about Europe's illiberal democracies. Now, number three are East Asian regimes, and this is somewhat complex. What we see is that East Asian regimes, when we think about them, it's thinking about those nations that emerged post-World War II that were having a great interest in industrializing and uh, they oriented themselves more around economic goals rather than political goals. And so these are typically seen as having more support for strong government, in which the government has more powers than we would expect in a Western liberal democracy. There is something to be said of the cultural Confucian tradition, which in the writings of Confucius, the uh, East Asian uh, philosopher, they stress loyalty, discipline, and duty. This is translated uh, in some ways to reject the idea of human rights and individualism. In the United States, we often think of ourselves as individual fir individuals first, where we need to prioritize our own self-interest over that of what the state or government wants from us. This is a little reversed in East Asian regimes because they see themselves as part more of a community first and then their individual identities are become second place to that. Now, four, your textbook raises what is called political is Islam. In political Islam, we see that political affairs are structured according to higher religious principles. For example, Iran is a complex mix of theocracy and democracy. To help us understand Iran, we should understand that all legislation is ratified by the Council of for the Protection of the Constitution. And this council ensures conformity to Islamic principles that are set forth by the teachings of that specific religion. Now, many Muslims have objected the classifications of all Islamic regimes as fundamentalists. We can see Iran being most notable 
that yes, the influence of Islam is evident, but there have been other developments in democratization that is uh, something to raise the question to. Uh, take the writings of Edward Said. He is going to write that when we think of what political Islam represents, to hold the view that political Islam is strictly fundamentalist would perpetuate the long-established Western prejudice, prejudices against exotic or a repressive East in which the people are repressed and they're not aware of all of the bountiful things that the West can offer. He argued this in his famous works on Orientalism. And so we can see political Islam, when we compare it to the West, political science in the West has kind of placed their own system, uh, prioritizing it, making it seem like it's the best system where political Islam uh, can be come in all forms and shapes and sizes. So to help us understand that, there is a video from Vox in which it's called How Iran's Election Could Make History. I'm going to invite you to watch that in the discussion board below as well. Number five, we come to military regimes. And military regimes are uh, when we think that leading posts in the government are based on the person's position within the military chain of command. We can see that military leaders often take control and then remain in power in times of extreme crisis. And so in a time of extreme crisis, the military may take command and normal political or constitutional arrangements are usually suspended. Things like elections may have to go away for a while while the military is in power. And Institutions through which opposition to military control can be expressed, such as uh, an elected assembly or a free press, are either weakened or just outright abolished and eliminated. To help us understand military regimes, there is yet another video by Vox in which they describe the military coup in Zimbabwe. How, does this, how can this be explained? What makes this a hallmark of a Western, uh, I'm sorry, a military regime? Well, that's something to consider as you're watching that video. So there you have it. We see the multiple regime types. We've gone through five, the only five mentioned in your textbook. And we can see that where would we classify the United States? Where would we classify nations like Zimbabwe or China or Iran or Saudi Arabia or Germany or Belgium or Brazil? Let's just go through a bunch of countries and start to think, Okay, what is significant about their system? That's it for this video. Uh, thank you for watching and keep up the great work.